I've had many interesting guests, and I have another one here today, Mr. Rawls Klotfelder, and he was introduced to me as the most highly decorated Airedale in the Navy in World War II, and I said, that's a show. And so here he is. Welcome to Veterans Forum, Rawls. Thank you. We're so glad to have you. Give us a little Reader's Digest version where you were born, raised, and so forth before the famous December 7th, 1941. Well, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh -huh. I was raised in Gadsden, Alabama. Uh -huh. And my three older brothers in 1942 were already in the service. Right. Well, where uh, were you? What, on what December the 7th. Yeah, what was going on? I mean, do you recall? I was 17 years old, and I had a job <laughs> uh -huh. with, a, with a truck farmer that raised tomatoes. Okay. And I heard that broadcast that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Right. Well, where's Pearl Harbor? <coughs> Anyhow, when, when, it all, when, when it all settled down, I wanted to joined the Navy. Uh -huh. And that's when my dad finally told me, he said, son, if you'll just join the Navy, I'll, I'll sign for you. Little did he know what we would find later uh -huh. <laughs> for clean sheets and good food. Right, right. Because it certainly wasn't uh -huh. in the Navy that, we, that I was in. Now, when, you, when did you exactly go in the Navy? Because clearly you talked your dad into it, so you right. went in. I went in in late, late, later part of 1942 uh -huh. and uh, went to boot camp in San Diego. Uh -huh. And I wanted to be a gunner's mate because my oldest brother was a gunner. Right. Well, I got close to it, but it was aerial gunnery. Flying this plane, this PV-1, is a derivative. It's a remodeled, improved airliner, Lockheed airliner. Really? They put bigger engines on it. First of all, they gave a few thousand of them to the British to fight the Germans, and they were called Hudson bombers. Oh, okay. Then when we got into the war, they put bigger engines on it uh -huh. and uh, a lot other improvements uh -huh. and called it the Ventura, Vega oh, okay. Ventura. You go back a little further than that, it's almost the plane that Amelia Earhart was in when she was lost in 1937. Oh, so it's okay. an old plane. Fascinating. That's but they, just, keep, they keep improving it. Right. Okay. This model here was the fastest plane in the Pacific. It, it could outfly, outrun any Japanese plane, uh -huh, uh -huh. which we were grateful. Uh, amen, brother. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Or we could be sitting here speaking Japanese on the West Coast. Yes. So as an aerial gunner, were you sitting in like that small little turret right here, looking uh, for... Right here in this twin... 50 caliber right, turret right. with uh, 1,600 rounds of ammunition. Say that again. How much rounds of ammunition? 1,600 rounds. Okay. Actually, it was less than a minute of firing. <laughs> so okay. you, didn't, you didn't just hold the trigger down. Yeah. You gave short burst. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So when did you get on a plane and go on your first mission? Out of this school in Oklahoma, they sent us to Seattle. Okay. From Seattle, we went to a brand new base at Whidbey Island, Washington. Whidbey Island, Washington. Okay. There we had extensive training uh -huh. <laughs> for about eight weeks. Okay. Then they put us on a little Jeep carrier down at Alameda, Los Al no Alameda, by on the bay. Right. On a little carrier, they put 15, 16 of these planes. Uh -huh. No way that you could fly off of it. You couldn't get off. I mean, it couldn't fly off anyhow. Right. The carrier was a was a ferry. Sort of a transport. Right. Yeah. Okay. These planes were loaded with fuel. Oh. Uh -huh. And three days out, the weather got warm, and the fuel tank started leaking. Now you've got a problem. You've yes. got all that fuel on all these planes leaking on the wood decks. Uh, yeah. And it, it, we had to get that fuel some of it out of each tank. Did and you throw have it a overboard. chaplain aboard this aircraft carrier? <laughs> Man, I'd want to be no, prayed up they, for sure. What they told us, what the story was that, well, if the Japanese fire two torpedoes in succession, one will go through the engine room, the other will over the flight deck. 
That's how fast this thing will sink. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. We offloaded at Pearl Harbor, uh -huh. flew across the island to Kaneohe Bay, uh -huh. and from there they sent us to Midway okay. to protect the uh, submarine tender that uh -huh. was stationed out there, okay. and also to patrol down towards Wake. Uh -huh. That was about three months, and then came back to Pearl and went to uh, the, the, uh, that was in December 1943. Okay. And uh, that's when we got to, to Tarawa. The big battle of Tarawa had yeah, just Yeah, my, my uncle was on the Pennsylvania blasting that island full of holes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got there and every tree was blown to bits. Everything that was any part of that island was just absolutely destroyed. Right. The sea right. bees had fixed part of the runway uh -huh. and we got in and they made the runway longer and we, we operated there for six months. Nimitz's plan was when he got his new navy built and uh -huh. that happened then. Right, right. He would start the road to Tokyo right at Tarawa. He would take Tarawa, he would skip 10 islands uh -huh. and take another one. Uh -huh. He would skip 10 or 12 more and take another one. Uh -huh. Instead of trying to just blast their way all the way to right. just Tokyo. Right, leapfrog your way, right. We stayed in Tarawa as a, as a group to blockade about 600,000 square miles of water so that no supply ships could come in to any of those bypassed islands uh -huh. and we bombed their runways to keep the runways out of service so they couldn't bring any planes through. I see. All the islands had avi aviation gasoline but they didn't have any runway that they could use. Okay. Every, every time we blasted holes in their runway two days later they've got them fixed so we've got to go back and do it again. There were seven islands in all that we had to keep uh -huh. destroyed. Uh -huh. Places like Nauru and Woji and uh, all of those islands had at least 90 anti-aircraft guns. And that's a lot of guns. It is. We lost several planes uh -huh. and we were shot up quite a bit. Uh -huh. But if I had known at that time that they had that kind of firepower, I wouldn't have gone. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a picture. It's a little fuzzy, but I... I hope you can see it. Uh, what was this all about? Well, 60 years after the war, I was awarded my medals, c citations for what we did during the war, for oh, World War okay. II. I was awarded two distinguished flying crosses and now nine is, uh, air medals. Are they here? Yes. That's the air medal. This is the air medal. Nine of those and two of these DFCs, a yes. Distinguished Flying Cross. It's very unusual for an enlisted man to get that medal, and I got two. <laughs> I don't know. A Distinguished Flying Cross is enormous. It's usually for pilots. Yes, yeah. What an honor. Well, I think they look back at the war and figure out what we did. If, if you're on a carrier and, an air, and a group uh, task force, you might make four invasions or four attacks. Right. We had eight months of one every other day. Well, let's <laughs> face it, the pilot's not going to go to, and not, uh, the pilots are very important. Please, pilots out there, we love you. But you're not going to get too far if you don't have a good gunner. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it takes a team. It takes a team. Well, looking yeah. back, this old passenger plane you look where the pilot is, he's behind the engines. Uh -huh. All the military planes, the pilot is in front of the engines. So uh -huh. he has a better view right. for protecting himself. Uh -huh. So it was important that we had two guns back here right. that we could see areas that he couldn't see. Uh, I'll tell you what happened one time. Have you got time? Yes, yes, we do. Navy intelligence officer said, go down to Bambia. 
-huh. It was a bypass Japanese island. He said, they have no guns, no, no heavy guns. Uh -huh. We want pictures from 10,000 feet flying north to south and then one east to west. Uh -huh. So as we got close to the island, I got in the turret. And as we got right over the island making pictures, I looked straight back and here's two big puffs of flak right on our tail. For, from, a, from an island that didn't have any. Suppo supposedly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah so right. I hollered up to the pilot to make a turn. I didn't care which way, turn right or left, to do something right, right now. Right, right. And he did, and where we were, the third or fourth burst of 90 millimeter aerial, you know, anti-aircraft guns would have probably got us, but we got away from the island and then circled around and, and got real low. There had been a, the, we had seen a boat or a ship tied up at the pier on this island. Uh -huh. So we decided that we would circle around about 25 miles out so they couldn't see us. Uh -huh. Then we'd come in and we'd get that boat. Uh -huh. But we couldn't hit any th part of the island because it was British and we'd have to pay the British for any damage. Now how big was this boat? I mean. It was maybe 100, 125 foot. Okay. It was a fast supply vessel. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So we would go around and then we'd come in right on the water uh -huh. and we'd drop three bombs uh -huh. and I would strafe and everything went fine. They picked us up pretty close in and started firing again with the small stuff. But uh -huh. as we came across the, the vessel, I had, on, I had gone down and set the intervalometer, which would give us three 500 pound bombs dropped 50 feet apart at 280 knots. Everything was fine. I'm up in the turret firing. I see one bomb hit the water short, uh -huh. one right on target, another one on the pier, and another one hit a building. Well, that's four. Uh -huh. I don't know what happened. I knew I had set it right. Uh -huh. So we got back to Tarawa, and we found out that a 20 millimeter round from the island had hit the bomb shackle inside the bomb bay on bomb number four oh. and caused it to fall in an armed condition. Oh, I see. But then it went right on up through the floor into the tank, fuel tank, under the navigator's table. Uh -oh. And all of our tanks were self-sealing, uh -huh. which the Japs weren't. Oh, okay. They burned up just like that. Oh, okay, so that's this safe. plane flew 300 miles back to Tarawa and didn't leak a drop. Now, how long did you stay in the Navy? Just as long as I had to. Mm -hmm. I got out in uh, 1945. And you had points. You built up points. Mm -hmm. And if you had enough points, you could get, you could re you could, uh, get right, out. Right, right. And when right. I, I had enough points when I got back. Well, listen, Rawls, this has been fascinating, but we've come to the end of our time, and I want to thank you well, so much for serving our country I in a serious for, time for of being need. So, uh, you are a great guest. You have nothing. I usually to don't say much about this. Uh huh. Well, we're glad you did because this is how we learn. Because. Hollywood sometimes doesn't give us an accurate accounting. They either minimize it or they exaggerate it, and you don't always get the whole truth. Folks, we're still at war. Pray for our troops. This is PJ Scott. God bless you. See you next time.